Okay, I think uh, good afternoon to all. I think uh, we do have uh, many alumni today yeah? and then also uh, people who has have actually involved with ASEAN Foundation before. Uh, today, uh, I'm actually, I uh, wanted to introduce myself first. I'm actually young. Uh, I'm actually the as executive director of ASEAN Foundation. So uh, it is an honor to be given to, uh, for me to actually uh, coordinate and then uh, do the interview uh, today, moderates the sessions for our first discussion with uh, USAID uh, for this year. And uh, the topics of today's uh, discussion will be on ASEAN youth-led social impact. So uh, I'm sure many people, uh, uh, youth will be thinking how to benefit. Uh? Also, our stakeholders are here today. So uh, we actually wanted to bring forward to you uh, what ASEAN Foundation and our partners has been doing uh, to develop the skill of the people and empower the youth to do some uh, social uh, activities and social business and uh, to change the life of the people in their society. So uh, ASEAN Foundation is, uh, would like to actually uh, have our partners with us, which I would like to introduce six of our speakers uh, today. Yeah? So uh, I'll go one by one. Our first speaker is actually uh, Ms. Larasati Indra Wagita. She is a senior officer of the Education, Youth and Sports Division ASEAN Secretariat. Lara is also the senior officer that in charge uh, um, of many projects related to uh, youth in ASEAN Secretariat. She joined the ASEAN Secretariat in 2016 as monitoring officer of the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Department and assumed her current position in 2018 uh, as uh, her main duty is managing ASEAN cooperation in youth and sports guided and uh, the ASEAN uh, work plan on youth 2016-2020 and ASEAN Work Plan on Sports 2016-2020. So uh, Lara is actually a very experienced person related to youth uh, sports and activities in ASEAN Secretariat. So our second um, speakers of today uh, will be uh, Mr. Diman Simanjuntak. And who is Mr. Diman uh, Simanjuntak? He is a senior ASEAN Affairs Specialist with USAID uh, ASEAN Office. So Diman is the... Um, person that uh, have long experience working in civil society before he joined international agency uh, such as UNDP and he also joined Research Triangle Institute and USAID. He joined the Democracy and Government Office of USAID Indonesia in 2010 and then moved to ASEAN office in 2014 to manage projects supporting ASEAN political security and social cultural communities. So a man with many experience. Uh, our third uh, speaker is uh, Gayatri uh, Prabho Sassi. Gayatri is actually Program Manager of ASEAN USAID Prospect. Uh, Ms. Gayatri graduated from Bandung Institute of Technology, ITB, Indonesia, as uh, she, her expertise is in Bachelor of Environmental Engineer. And she also received a Master in Public Administration, uh, MPA, a degree from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy of National University of Singapore in 2007. So since early 2019, uh, Gayatri actually serves as a program manager of the ASEAN USAID Prospect Project. Uh, this is a partnership uh, of, uh, for regional uh, optimization within the political security and social cultural communities. So um, again, uh, Gayatri is very experienced and we have been doing some projects together with her for quite some time. So, so uh, our fourth uh, speaker is actually Satyo Siomeri. Uh, Satyo is actually uh, a program manager and now he's in charge. Uh, he's a program manager with um, uh, ASEAN USAID Prospect. Uh, so uh, Satyo is also experienced in terms of entrepreneurship uh, program. So now he's in charge of entrepreneurship program for US Prospect. US Aid Prospect. And uh, our next uh, speaker is actually Tamil Joyce, uh, our young, inspiring uh, businesswoman, I would just say, a uh, business lady. Yeah? So Miss Tamil mm -hmm. Joyce is actually a founder of uh, Four Peace for Philippines. And uh, Kamil actually is a social, she is also the founder of the social journalism campaigns. Uh? I mean, if you want to know about Four Peace later, she will share with you and how she come about to embark on this journey. Yeah? So 
So I uh, just wanted to share with you one good thing is um, she's also the winner of the uh, uh, championship last year for the ASEAN Youth Social Journalism 2019. And she won the award on January 2020. So uh, this is a, a project that she, uh, uh, community yeah, for the poor people, for the needy people in her uh, country. So uh, later she will share with you. And she is also actively uh, embarking uh, for peace into COVID-19 uh, crisis program right now. So later on, uh, Camille will share with you her programs. And uh, last but not least, we have Dali Shafar. And Dali is actually a business director of PT Biops Agrotechno Indonesia. And uh, this is another aspire, inspiring uh, um, uh, success uh, case of our programs and USAID programs. Uh. So actually, uh, Dali has uh, uh, started this PT Bios Agrotechno Indonesia in Indonesia, and uh, he is uh, looking into management and business skills. Uh. And I would like to share that uh, Dali actually. Uh, uh, have a master program uh, in science and business management from Utrecht University in Netherlands. So he actually uh, enhanced his skills uh, after he started his business after his degree. He found that it is not sufficient. So he further pushed it to get his master and further enhance his skills. So uh, these are actually uh, six of our uh, very experienced uh, speakers. So without further ado, uh, let me just uh, call upon and invite our first speaker, uh, Lara, to share with us about her program. Lara, please. Uh, Lara, your audio, uh, your mic. Yes. Uh, still, I uh, can't hear you. Uh, Lara, the <laughs> mic is... Can you hear okay, me? Now? Sorry. You may start again. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Great. Sorry about that. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as briefly introduced by Dr. Yang, uh, I am Lara Sati, but you can just call me Lala, like Lala Land. Uh, I'm working as a senior officer at the Education, Youth, and Sports Division of the ASEAN Secretariat. And my day to day duties include managing ASEAN cooperation in the areas of youth and sports. But as you see on the screen, my presentation today will focus on uh, ASEAN cooperation on youth development. I will talk about uh, how the youth sector is working towards realizing the ASEAN Community Vision 2025 through collaboration with uh, our ASEAN dialogue partners and also partner organizations. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that most of you are already familiar with the ASEAN community. But uh, if I may refresh you a little bit on this structure. Uh, in 2015, the ASEAN community was launched. Uh, it happened 48 years after the establishment of the ASEAN itself. There are three pillars. The first one is ASEAN political security community pillar. Second one, ASEAN economic community pillar, which you may have heard very often. Uh, sorry, Lala, if I may, uh, can you share the slides, the PPT? Oh, wait. <laughs> yes. I thought I was uh, already sharing. Uh, not, not yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Wait. Yeah. Sorry for that. Share screen. Yep. You can see yeah. it now? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Maybe you can okay. have a food. Yeah. That's <laughs> wonderful. Great. All right. Okay. So let me continue. Uh, it's on the pillars of the ASEAN community, okay? Uh, the second one, ASEAN economic community, and then the third one is the ASEAN social cultural community pillar. Uh, but why these three pillars? Uh, if I can give you a little bit of background. Since its founding in 1967, ASEAN has enjoyed uh, this long lasting regional peace and stability, uh, maintaining mutual respect among the member states, and we should not take this achievement for granted because Peace and stability has led to the economic progress that we've been seeing these days and further even led to some significant social progress such as poverty reduction. But as you know, ASEAN is very diverse, including in terms of the development progress of each country. So to support the three pillars, as you see at the bottom, ASEAN is also working on the narrowing the development gap initiative for ASEAN integration focusing uh, on four countries, Cambodia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, and Vietnam. 
Okay, uh, next, the establishment of the ASEAN community back in 2015 was uh, actually accompanied by the adoption of the ASEAN community vision 2025. It's a little bit wordy here, but uh, I'll articulate this for you. Uh, the vision declares ASEAN's aspiration towards a rules-based, people-oriented and people-centered ASEAN community, where our peoples enjoy human rights and fundamental freedom higher quality of life and the benefits of community building, reinforcing our sense of togetherness and common identity, guided by the purposes and principles of the ASEAN Charter. So realizing the ASEAN Community Vision 2025 requires multi-sectoral efforts and collaboration. It's pretty clear. And these two parts that are highlighted, people-oriented and people-centered ASEAN community in the sense of togetherness and common identity are the whole purpose of the ASEAN socio-cultural community. Okay, so one of the areas under the ASEAN socio-cultural community pillar is the whole purpose of our uh, talk today, the youth sector. If you look into this vision that was declared in 2015, right after the establishment of the ASEAN community, you will understand that uh, ASEAN member states are basically sharing the same view. Youth is the future of ASEAN, it's clear. The age range of youth is as in ASEAN is 15 to 35 years old. And at this point, we have 30% of the ASEAN population who are uh, within that age range. So the region's future is depending on youth's ability to lead in the next decade, if not years. This is why uh, youth is the main priorities in ASEAN's development agendas and an issue that cuts across the work of different sectors. Okay. Okay, uh, but yeah, some of us might wonder, how does ASEAN do it? How does ASEAN cooperate to achieve the goals of that grand vision? So ASEAN undertakes cooperation in youth development through the ASEAN youth sector. It's, it consists of the representatives of ministries, national agencies in charge of youth development, and we call it SOM, ASEAN Senior Officials Committee on Youth. They meet every year uh, to discuss this uh, higher strategy, the strategic direction of youth development in the region, and uh, update each other on the progress at the national level. Okay, uh, all of the 10 countries cooperate with each other, and it's not based, uh, it's, it's been guided by this strategic document it's called ASEAN Work Plan on Youth 2016-2020. And uh, under this work plan, we have five priorities. The first one is to sustain the focus on youth entrepreneurship through uh, activities like capacity building, mentoring program. And secondly, um, it's on youth employability. Uh, so, you know, projects on skills training, lifelong education. Thirdly, um, enhancing ASEAN awareness and appreciation of ASEAN community through people-to-people -people exchange program. This is very popular when it comes to youth development sector. Uh, you know, all those youth exchange programs with the dialogue partners of ASEAN, uh, they all fall under this uh, priority. Number four, um, volunteerism and leadership programs. Uh, there, have been, there have been some projects in the past uh, contributing to this area, like the ASEAN Youth Volunteering Program, if you recall. It was led by Malaysia and implemented through support from the USA. My fellow speaker here, Pak Divine, might want to talk about it again later. And the last one is uh, to increase youth competencies and resilience with advanced technological and managerial skills. So uh, today we will talk about some of the projects that have been contributed, contributing to uh, the work plan uh, implementation, uh, like the ASEAN Social Journalism Contest, and also uh, the Impact Challenge. I believe uh, my uh, colleagues here from the USA and also Prospect uh, are in the better position to uh, elaborate on those activities. And uh, if you notice earlier, I keep mentioning about dialogue partners, entities associated with ASEAN and other partner organizations. Uh, they are indeed playing crucial roles in the implementation of the uh, work plan on youth 2016-2020. Uh, all of these partner organizations and some of these ASEAN dialogue partners have been invited to the annual meeting of the youth sector, uh, which I mentioned earlier, to share updates on the activities they have implemented. 
just to explain a little bit, the ASEAN youth sector collaborates with its partner in a number of ways. Uh, it can be through full or partial funding support, technical assistance, um, in-kind support, and even full funding and implementation of activities. But there is one important condition. Uh, these activities must have been acknowledged by the ASEAN youth sector as contributing to the implementation of some specific programs under uh, the work plan, which is very broad and uh, comprehensive. And uh, this is a process that actually promotes synergy and coherence of efforts among multiple development actors in the region. Right here, I want to show you some photos. Uh, as you see here, this is uh, the famous Genesis uh, exchange program uh, through cooperation with Japan. And then this one is from the ASEAN Russia Youth Summit. This is a, a vocational training pro project on uh, KBUT uh, through collaboration with the uh, Republic of Korea, of course. And then there's also some educational exchange program. This one is with China. And that's it. so uh, these are basically how, how uh, some activities under uh, the work plan is being addressed uh, through collaboration with partners. Okay. And next, um, the thing is, how do we know if ASEAN's effort in youth development are relevant enough for the beneficiaries, which is the youth who are, uh, I believe that there are a lot here, right? Okay, um, ASEAN launched its first youth development index in 2017. Uh, it is actually uh, our first attempt to measure youth development based on selected domains and indicators deemed relevant and important to uh, all ASEAN member states. Uh, there are actually five domains. Yeah. Uh, but in 2017, uh, the report covered only four uh, domains because these are uh, domains that are highly statistical, while the fifth one is rather qualitative. So, in this inaugural cycle of the Youth Development Index, we did it separately. Okay, there are four uh, domains here education, health and well being, employment and opportunity, and participation and engagement. The core purpose of this initiative is to ensure that the strategic pathway of the ASEAN youth sector is uh, very much, pretty much relevant with the, uh, to the needs of uh, ASEAN youth. Okay, let's see here. There are some gaps I mean, um, in terms of the finding of the report. Uh, it, said, it, it concluded that health and well-being and education uh, are reported to have improved across the region. While for employment and opportunity and also participation and engagement, we're a bit lagging behind and in need of policy development and also perhaps more well-targeted uh, programs. Okay. Um, now, uh, I believe you understand what I'm going to talk about by only looking into this slide. The fourth industrial revolution. Right? It has been a very hot topic, not only through the lens of the ASEAN economic pillar, but also the social cultural pillar. Because the whole point of innovation is uh, ideally to increase people's quality of life, not the other way around, right? Uh, but then there's um, maybe not only this report, there are also many reports out there. Um, but this one I uh, I'm referring uh, to the Global Employment Trends for Youth 2020 report published by the ILO recently. Uh, it concludes that the new technologies are disrupting labor markets across the world by both destroying and creating jobs. As you see, this during this COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned that disruptions actually can come from many directions, not just due to technological advancement. You see how, how we are now so disrupted? People lose their jobs, uh, not due to their skills, but due to the nature of the core businesses. And then less techno savvy people are forced to use online platforms to do basically everything. So uh, while those with no access to technology are left with no options. Um, but then uh, on the other frame, you see some young people who are able to find opportunities to keep their businesses going while also contributing to community development such as this garment company who decided to produce uh, some personal protective equipment for the health workforce and things that are similar to that. So it shows that actually it's not only about technical intelligence or skills that are important. It's 
we need to look into the resilience of our youth, adaptability, integrity, empathy. They are all now believed to be crucial in enabling ASEAN youth to uh, navigate the labor market amidst any kinds of disruptions, including this kind of pandemic. And also, it will inspire them to help address societal issues, such as narrowing the digital divide. That we that's very, I mean, it's very valid to talk about it uh, during these days. Okay. So, uh, based on the findings of the Youth Development Index and also uh, this whole conversation about the Industrial Revolution, um, the ASEAN Youth Ministers have set the direction of our post-2020 ASEAN Youth Development, which is to balance the technical skills and soft skills in our youth. Soft skills, sometimes we also say uh, 21st century skills. Uh, ASEAN will focus on fostering future-ready ASEAN youth through digital skills development and strengthen youth engagement mechanisms, be it through policy discourse, social entrepreneurship, and also volunteerism. Now, this is why synergy and partnership with multiple actors is important. Like partner organizations, like the ASEAN Foundation here, uh, they have networks with private sectors and uh, flexibility to collaborate with different partners. While uh, ASEAN Dialog partners might have capacity to link us up with prominent experts and also access to uh, funding support. So these synergy and collaboration can level up the work of ASEAN youth sector towards realizing that ASEAN Community Vision 2025. And uh, towards this end, the ASEAN youth ministers have agreed to have the next work plan because the current one will expire soon. Uh, the 2021-2025 20, work plan will be structured around the five domains of ASEAN Youth Development Index that I mentioned earlier. And for its implementation, uh, ASEAN, will, will, ASEAN will still uh, work closely with its partners, including ASEAN Foundation and also ASEAN Dialog Partners, which is the US. So um, that's almost the end of my uh, presentation. Um, I believe that you can get more information and sense of you know how how the youth mm -hmm. sector has been working with with the partners through these publications, uh, ASEAN Youth Bites, mm -hmm. and uh, the ASEAN magazine that has just been launched by uh, the ASEAN Secretariat. There's an article by our moderator here, Dr. Yang. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> please download these publications on ASEAN website. Uh, you mm -hmm. can learn more about uh, ASEAN initiatives on. Yeah. Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lara. Thank you for the great sharing. And I actually uh, so interested to later, maybe perhaps if there is a uh, time for us to ask you to explore about soft skill, yeah? because uh, many many youth or many people thinking that as long as you are good in technology, you can survive for the next. Uh, uh, many years, sir. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. this is on the industry IR 4.0. Uh, so later on, maybe we can explore what is needed uh, for the youth mm -hmm. to be uh, uh, to be uh, ready for this uh, future ready. You know, so let's see what kind of elements uh, they need to actually pay some attention to, apart from uh, technical and technology assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me just call uh, our second speaker. Uh, which is uh, Mr. Diman Simanjunta, uh, who is also a senior ASEAN Affairs Specialist, USAID or ASEAN officer. Or, so uh, without further ado, uh, he will actually highlight the effort uh, to support the ASEAN community through youth activities. So he will share with you his uh, uh, experience, please. Uh, Diman, I think the... Diman's... Uh, Mike, yeah. Okay. Yes. Because I need permissions for the host to unmute me. So. <laughs> yeah, my, my, so, uh, my boss. Yes. <laughs> you need my so, boss' permission. So he's, my, he's our boss now. So thank you, Ian, and thank you, Lala, for a very uh, comprehensive presentation on ASEAN. And everybody here already about the uh, programs in ASEAN, and also uh, uh, Lala mentions about Jala Partners. And you see the United States of America flags as one of the partners. And US is very active to support ASEAN. 
and uh, I'm actually working based in Jakarta, and in Jakarta in the U.S. Embassy we have two missions. Uh, one is, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Somebody's mic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. You just, uh, yeah. So, which means that I get another five minutes because of this, right? <laughs> Your job plus, plus two. <laughs> plus two. Okay. So, uh, I'm working in the U.S. Embassy in, in Jakarta, but we have actually two missions. Uh, one mission is for Indonesia missions and uh, is responsible to strengthen relationship between the United States and the ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN meaning the, the whole 10 country. So we are uh, one of the dialogue partners and we have a strategic partnership or agreement with ASEAN. Uh, we are also uh, Lala Minson support the work plans and we have the plan of actions between ASEAN and the United States. And specifically we are working to extend this uh, plan of actions uh, until 2021, 2025, to make it comply uh, or align with the ASEAN work plan on June also, 2025, 2025, which in the uh, education and sports uh, mentions clearly that USA, US government uh, have commitments to cultivate youth entrepreneurship, creativity, innovations, volunteerism, and also uh, strengthen networking and leadership development among youth. Uh, in the next five years. So we did it actually uh, 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 with our previous program, but we, and we will continue. Uh, there is like a one thing that after working for five years in ASEAN, I noticed that uh, when I meet youth, youth will think when I say about ASEAN, it's about a bureaucratic uh, entity, government, and old and boring. <laughs> so we need to change that. This is what Lala said. This is like a, this is people exchange. This is people to people connections. You That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. But remember, there is a survey actually, yeah. uh, uh, in uh, recently that nearly forty percent of ASEAN youth under thirty express that they have no connectivity to ASEAN, not at all. Mm. So it's huge number. If Lala said it's a thirty percent, thirty percent is like from six hundred ten million, right? Uh, people, so it's huge number. So we need to uh, reduce this number uh, to the uh, youth development index. I think we can track uh, the progress, uh, but we want to help also. Uh, U.S. government want to help uh, with uh, several of our programs. So uh, our programs uh, will uh, will focus on uh, realizing the ASEAN vision 2025, uh, the one ASEAN one community. We are big family. Uh, which is quite uh, unique for me because I'm actually Indonesian, I'm part of the ASEAN citizen, but I'm actually representing the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So it's a good bridge between the U.S. and the ASEAN, right? And uh, for the pro programs, uh, I will briefly explain about the programs that we support, but then our colleagues from Prospect will uh, go deeper. Uh, in the previous support, for instance, we had program, uh, it was it is called the ASEAN Youth Volunteer Program. Actually, it is in the partnership with the University Kebangsa Malaysia. Uh, this uh, program uh, is uh, uh, dedicated uh, for youth volunteerism that creates opportunity for knowledge-driven volunteerism and for a sense of regional identity. So we want to promote not Indonesia, not Philippines, not Vietnam, but ASEAN identity. That's one. So this is kind of like a, the ASEAN vision actually that we want to, to build. And of course, we are very proud that uh, we supported the uh, ASEAN Foundation Model ASEAN meeting from the mid, from the beginning until, I mean, from the first uh, uh, launch of that uh, meetings. And our colleagues in the US Mission to ASEAN have a very famous program. It is called the Young South East Asia Leaders Initiative or YCLI. Uh, these programs uh, build the leadership capabilities of youth in the region and promotes cross-border cooperation to solve regional and global challenges. So there are opportunities for youth people in the regions and it's all open. Uh, I hope that uh, this can be uh, can reduce that 40% that I mentioned before who have no connectivity with ASEAN because we want to connect you. We want to connect all the youth uh, in, in the regions. And we 
uh, we have this project we call prospect it's not youth project but many activities under this project uh, are, are approved already or endorsed by ASEAN relevant uh, sectoral body we promote youth uh, in the uh, in the inclusions tolerance and moderations uh, among the youth community there is like a annual youth video contest this is for youth uh, who are interested in video makers you can build your skill here and the last two actually the, the two that we will discuss further so i will not uh, talk about it uh, quite uh, deeper the asian youth entrepreneurship programs to promote entrepreneurship in, in among youth in the, in the region and also youth social journalism so without further ado i think you know i will leave the next speaker to uh, uh, provide more information about this thank you very much uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimana. Uh, actually, uh, I'm actually, uh, this ASEAN Foundation is agreeable that there's a lot of work after this. 40% huh? is very high for us. <laughs> so uh, that shows that, that we got a lot of work to do after this. And I hope that using today's platform, huh, uh, we can actually get our youth today or our stakeholders or potential partners or universities to actually viral it for us. Huh? Uh, share with the students and share with any youth that you come across your friends or whatever come forward and join our programs because there are many many programs that are waiting for you to respond that's why uh, what Lala mentioned just now about engagement uh, youth engagement is still there is a lot of gaps so uh, our biggest target uh, for this year hopefully this COVID things going to be uh, subside uh, we can actually go to the rural area and reach out to more youth I think that uh, Unable to uh, access to the technology sometimes can be quite challenging for them. Huh? Uh, don't have any broadbands and certain countries still have this kind of issues. So uh, digital gap and all that. So I think uh, our jobs uh, as uh, this, all our partners here, so USAID and Prospect, uh, ASAC, uh, ASEAN Secretariat, we need to actually go to the ground, grassroots area to actually reach out to them. So if you can't come to us, we will try to go to you, all right? So uh, actually, uh, the uh, my boss, the organizer, told me that uh, the person handled this technical that uh, the uh, session here of Zoom already full because our package is not uh, huge enough. So uh, I have uh, suggestions for those of you who really can't assess. Maybe you can pass it to your friends. We do have a site uh, HTTPS our Facebook, uh, our uh, ASEAN Foundation Facebook. You can assess. It's uh, www.facebook.com slash ASEAN. ASEAN is a capital letter. Uh, ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N. Foundation is a small, small letter. Foundation F is high. Yeah? So I think I will try to type it out here. Uh, just give me some minutes. Uh, so you can share with uh, your friends uh, whether... Wait, wait a minute. Uh, you can share with your friend. Yeah, it's already there. Uh, thanks, uh, HTTP, Facebook.com, ASEAN Foundation. Uh, you can actually go there and uh, get your friends to actually listen to the talk, follow us from there. And you can also post your question there because uh, my team will actually get it to me and we try to answer you. So uh, thank you. So we come back again uh, to our third speakers. I think she's very excited, <laughs> Gayatri. So our third speaker today is Gayatri Prabhu Sasi. She's actually a program manager of ASEAN US Aid Prospect. And uh, she would uh, share with you uh, the uh, ASEAN Youth Social Journalism programs today and also other projects that in the pipeline that she would like to invite all the youth to come and uh, join us. Please, Gayatri. Thank you. Yeah. Let me share my screen. Yes. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Um, good afternoon to uh, all the viewers and the participants of live, the live talk. Thank you to Dr. Yang. And I'm very privileged to participate in this live talk, uh, supporting USAID, Padiman, and also with my colleague uh, Satyo from uh, Prospect as well. So I'm the one of the program managers uh, in ASEAN USAID Prospect. Um, I've been with the project for one year. Um, most of my career uh, was uh, around ASEAN, um, so 
I also worked for ASEAN Secretariat for over 13 years uh, before uh, joining ASEAN USAID Prospect. So um, I'm excited to be assigned to, um, to be in charge or look after uh, activities uh, for youth because I've been longing to know more about these kinds of ASEAN activities on youth. Um, I'm, a, I'm going to speak about um, USAID Prospect Youth Initiatives. And uh, if you see here, this is the picture of ASEAN Youth Social Journalism Contest 2017 participants. Um, it's taken in Singapore. Before um, I go deeper, um, I'd like to introduce a little bit, just a brief introduction of what is ASEAN USA Prospect. It's a five-year, multi-year project from 2018 to 2023 and the successor to the ASEAN US Progress Project. Uh, which was implemented five years before. So it's very relevant because a lot of our initiatives continues and expands the efforts of progress. So we assist ASEAN in developing, designing, and implementing com comprehensive multi-year initiatives for Southeast Asia. Our works, uh, we have three work streams. The first one is non-traditional -trad security. Like what Pat Diman said that, um, that uh, it's not only youth uh, projects that we're working on, but also in other areas. So these are the other areas, non-traditional security, like human and wildlife trafficking, violent extremism and humanitarian crisis or disaster management. And the second work stream is responsive and transparent gov governance. Um, and the third work stream, which is our current focus right now, is the rights and opportunities for all. Um, the, the objective is to strengthen its partnership with ASEAN to promote and protect human rights and seek ways to engage civil society and provide increased citizen voice in decision making. This is also for people who are traditionally excluded, like women and youth. So uh, three areas are under this third work stream that are human rights, youth engagement, and expanding rights and opportunities of women and other vulnerability groups. So Prospects Initiatives for Youth are meant to engage youth to more frequently contribute to ASEAN processes and strengthen shared ASEAN identity. So this is very in line with um, ASEAN's overall goal to raise awareness and um, get youth to be more engaged and uh, more identify themselves as ASEAN citizens. We mostly support, uh, like what Lala said, um, from the Youth Development Index, we support the fourth and the fifth um, uh, element, which is employment and opp opportunity and awareness and values and identity. So these are the three initiatives under um, PROSPECT. Um, the first one is the ASEAN Youth Video Contest. I've had the privilege to uh, support uh, one activity, which was last year, one contest, which was, which was last year. Um, the purpose is to showcase social consciousness among ASEAN youth on selected theme per contest. Um, and it has been running for five years since 2015, and the last one was 2019. And uh, it was quite an exciting contest, um, if uh, any of the youth viewers would like to join the next one. The second is uh, ASEAN Youth Social Journalism Contest um, with, with objective to stimulate inter-community engagement and dialogue on selected theme. And uh, it has been implemented twice. The first is 2017 and the, la the second one, not the last, the second one was last year, 2019. And the third one is ASEAN Youth Entrepreneurship Program uh, and my colleague Setio will talk more about this program later. For ASEAN Youth Social Journalism, um, this is, uh, I'm going to talk more about this because this is all, um, one of the programs that we will talk about. Our partners are, are SOMY, uh, the ASEAN Sectoral Body in Charge of Youth. They're supported by the EYSD, Education and Youth Sports Division, where Lala is uh, from, and the ASEAN Foundation. So with the U ASEAN USAID prospect, uh, the four uh, of us, 
became the organizing committee and uh, the technical evaluation committee for AYSJ, as well as um, AYVC video contest. The objective uh, of AYSJ is to engage talented ASEAN youth to share and promote fact-based and compelling messages on selected theme and issues, um, with, whether it's in their community or in ASEAN member states or in the region. And this is done by uh, media platforms. So in each contest, um, a training workshop will bring 20 selected uh, youth from 10 ASEAN member states to learn what it means to be uh, a social journalist. And the workshop will also provide uh, skills training and also uh, how to make different uh, media formats and how to reach a, a wider audience. Our trainer actually is present here. Uh, his name is Horea Salajan. Mm. And um, so the theme for 2019 contest was to explore the importance importance and unresponsive and transparent governance in, day, in their day-to-day -day lives through journalism. Uh, we see this contest as important because uh, around one-third of uh, ASEAN population, that's 650 million, they age around uh, between 15 and 34 years old, and they are active users of social media. And uh, it was launched on May 31st, uh, from uh, with 300 uh, applicants. So the 300 applicants submitted essays, 600 word essays. So we selected 20 from uh, 300 uh, applicants and they participated in, in the training workshop in Brunei Darussalam. And um, the selection criteria is uh, for the essays. This is just the first step. Um, first is the clarity of ideas, second is the adherence of, to theme, and third is the creativity, and fourth is potential reader impact and originality. So the essay must clearly demonstrate and understand the theme and why it is important to youth in ASEAN community. And this is the workshop and learning. Um, so they receive um, practical skills uh, training, like uh, vid uh, taking videos and making caption videos. And if you see the uh, left bottom picture, uh, that is our trainer discussing the possible topics with one of the teams. Uh, so the 20 finalists, they were, um, they were teamed up in 20, um, in 20 teams and, um, and, so they chose different topics. I'm sorry if there's a piano uh, sound. Yeah. I, I, forgot, I forgot that my child is, is having a piano lesson it's today. Okay. That is a special <laughs> about work from home. Huh? They always yes. have this kind of thing. It's fine, I think. <laughs> OK, so I hope yeah. the piano lesson cheer you up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, each country um, selected different topics like Brunei um, is about a family uh, setting, um, a family setting uh, topic. And the teams that are in bold letters, they are actually the winners of the AYSJ um, 2019 campaign. So these are the top three winners. Uh, we have the Philippines, Malaysia. Indonesia, uh, and these are the finalists. Um, this is Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And this is our study tour, the AYSJ study tour in Brunei Darussalam. Um, the, our host, the school, uh, is a local media platform. They took the participants to uh, Palita Brunei, Tita Brunei is a government-based uh, newspaper, and to, the, to Progressive Radio, it's an independent uh, media platform. So the participants can tell the difference, the different approaches of, um, of how to engage the public and journalism in, in different uh, approaches. And this is their tour to the water village. So the impacts and lessons learned here is that um, it's, it's uh, wonderful to know that our Philippines team campaign 
um, have reached 120,000 more followers. And like Lao PDR team, they also have 4,700 more followers. And uh, some of the campaigns remain ongoing, even after the winner's announcement or this early January. And uh, we learn also that each campaign must adjust to their own culture and society in their country. Some countries, especially with the last year's theme because it's about governance transparency, uh, some countries are not much more open compared to others. So the, some participants need to adjust. Um, and uh, from uh, two of the participants here, two teams, they said that the training was really eye-opening and that they had to be tactful in creating content creation and uh, because, the, because the issue can be quite sensitive and they had to ensure that the content uh, needs to be engaging. Um, and the Indonesian team who won third place also said that it was challenging. They had to learn a lot of things, but finally they found their voices. So on behalf of the AYSJ 2019, I would like to say thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing. Uh, thank you, Gaya Three, uh, for sharing. <laughs> and this also is... the piano lesson. <laughs> uh, I think the piano lesson um, cannot avoid. <laughs> you can't <laughs> ask them to go elsewhere. So, yeah. uh, thank you for sharing about uh, these three programs. Uh, I think uh, you're mentioning about ASEAN Youth Video Contest. It's called yeah. AYBC. This is actually the core of today's uh, program, also. And then also we have uh, ASEAN Youth Social Journalism Contest, AYSJ, and ASEAN Youth uh, Entrepreneur Programs, huh? which uh, uh, my next speaker, uh, we're going to call upon uh, Satyo Someri, which, uh, who is also a program manager of ASEAN USA Prospect, to share with us about this entrepreneur program. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, yes. I hope everybody can hear me because I've been having some audio problems before. Loud and clear. Yeah, great. Yes, yes. So uh, it's an honor for me to be in uh, the panelists amongst you know great people right now that I've been working with for the past year. Just a little background about myself, other than working on uh, youth and social entrepreneurship, I also mm -hmm. work on issues relating to um, violent extremism, um, as well as issues on anti-corruption and I guess other issues that I won't get into right now. But Basically, the, the Youth Entrepreneurship Program, as Sasi earlier mentioned, uh, falls uh, under the work stream three of the USAID ASEAN Prospect uh, Program, uh, which essentially is to enhance the ASEAN institutional's capacity to provide opportunities for underserved populations. Uh, you know, in designing this program, we took into account that this initiative needs to be aligned in one of the ASEAN's instruments, and, and, and at that point, it was the 2016 to 2020 ASEAN work plan on youth, particularly on the priority areas tending to the establishment of youth entrepreneurs network and collaboration among businesses and youth sector organizations. So in support of such initiative uh, in 2019, which is the first time that I think Prospect or even um, Progress, uh, its predecessor Progress, which I was not involved in, uh, created, you. Uh, with the endorsement uh, from in collaboration with the ASEAN senior officials on youth, uh, created a platform which we expect to become a sustained ecosystem within the ASEAN some way, through which uh, startup youth entrepreneurs will be able to engage with relevant stakeholders, particularly private sectors in improving their business skills and knowledge, as well as resource potential financing to help them realize the goals. Uh, this platform will also uh, help participating youth to better understand the uh, complex and complex economic and social issues facing in the ASEAN region and encourage them to actively to have an active role to begin resolving this youth, this, these issues and to introduce, introduce new and innovative solutions to the, challenging face, the challenges facing the region. So to that end, uh, in 2019, uh, we supported uh, the fifth year of the ASEAN Impact Challenge, which is actually a program uh, established by the Impact Hub of Kuala Lumpur. And we work together as well with the ASEAN Foundation as well as the ASEAN Songhai. Uh, in that fifth year of the AIC, uh, the ASEAN Impact Challenge uh, is the AIC, uh, 
the main theme of the challenge is circular economy, which I think some of us know it's basically utilizing you know old things to become something new uh, and useful. And so the AIC itself aims to build the capacity of innovators in the region, accelerate impact through scaling of innovations, and amplify the reach and engagement of businesses on the SDGs. So the AIC initiative itself comprises comprise of several uh, processes. Uh, Prospect, along with Impact, Impact Hub, conducted a call for proposals and in which we received over 70 proposals from 70 startup business ventures. And then we're a team of judges, including myself, uh, and a selected partners from the private sector, mostly of uh, venture capital, uh, judged them by uh, a set of criteria regarding their innovativeness, their scaling models, the uh, capacity of the team members to actually carry out this program, uh, their, their uh, innovation, and whether or not the contribution, uh, their innovation contributes to the achievement of DGs, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think that's very key uh, in all of the uh, ventures that are available that applied for this position. We need to make sure that they in somehow collaborated uh, uh, to the achievement of the SDGs. So after that long list process, we, we selected 10 teams representing uh, each of the 10 member states, ASEAN member states. Just to give you a bit of a background on the short list of teams, uh, uh, there's a team from Indonesia, which I think uh, will be uh, in, the, in the subsequent uh, session later on, called Biops Agrotechno, who developed a product called Enco Motion, and apologize for that if I pronounced that incorrectly, which is essentially a machine to machine Internet of Things technology that allows farmers to irrigate their farm precisely and automatically, and powered by a patent algorithm to calculate the water needs by the farm that is calculated from the environment. And we also have Crying Movement from Malaysia. Uh, this is uh, this is pretty interesting because they also uh, try to kill uh, one bird with two stones, so, or is it the other way around? <laughs> Birds with one stone. Uh, they, 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 they want to tackle the issue of low income of women, save additional income opportunities by providing them the necessary strength to produce quality and effective products. And those products are reusable sort of fabrics for hotels that can be reused as a uh, fashion product like clothes or anything else like that. So that, so they try to both create sustainable uh, development as well as support uh, poor women in their in their countries. Malaysia. And then we have another another innovation is G G Matrix from the Philippines, who uses waste to produce composite board, which is essentially building materials and provide a sustainable waste management practice while at the same time provide a supply to the growing market demand for building materials. So they can make uh, walls and bricks and everything else from these wastes. So that was something interesting. Um, I will, I think the uh, foundation will share uh, to the participants today uh, regarding all the innovations that we were, that was selected, uh, the 10 innovation that was selected during the, the initial uh, uh, call for application process. So at the end of the selection process, uh, we underwent a series of online mentorship with other startups or, or, or established uh, to just give them an understanding of what they had to go through in terms of developing um, or, or the ups, the ups and downs of you know, creating or developing their ventures, and also uh, an in-person capacity building program. At which point, Crossback at that time provided supported uh, the program by providing support to a series of workshops that were aimed to enhance uh, enhancing the youth social entrepreneurship capacity in engaging with other stakeholders, whether that be from the private sector, sector or international organizations. So mm -hmm. some of these topics um, include, you know, deeper knowledge of circular economy impact-based storytelling and presentation strategies, uh, scaling up strategies. I mean, because most of these innovations are usually community level, or if you're lucky, it's at national level. 
Uh, but um, so how do we make sure that that sort of impact can also be amplified at the regional level? And so then they also have the opportunity to learn on how to effectively partner with other private sector players in that aspect. So um, once that workshop was completed, we, we, we provided a we facilitated the 10 teams to do a quick five minute pitch on their innovation to a panel of judges consisting officials from the ASEAN Somwai, uh, senior officials on youth, uh, private sector players, and international organizations who are involved in SDG. So that is, is very quite important uh, because we believe, um, uh, the team and I believe that social entrepreneurship programs should not only provide the youth with the opportunity to be more economically self-sufficient, and but they, they should also aim in thinking about how their innovations can contribute to the development of the social impacts. They have to get locally at first, but with the expectations of this kind of support will contribute to a more of a development uh, initiatives, scaling it up at the global sphere, regional or even the global sphere. Global sphere. So that's why it's particularly interesting, it's particularly um, a must that in all of these youth social entrepreneurship programs, we we um, must have it related to the ability of their program or their innovation to contribute to the uh, sustainable development goals. So for the future, um, we expect to continue our collaboration with uh, ASEAN Y uh, this year uh, to have a more of a sustained platform or ecosystem by which these social entrepreneurs can showcase their innovation and have access to partners uh, that can further expand their reach and impact regionally. Uh, at the moment, we're still, uh, we've discussed this. I think uh, Malala also was also present on that meeting um, regarding what to do with the social entrepreneurship program this year. And I think the discussion has been quite uh, advanced at this time. And then we're now talking to your colleague, Dr. Yang at, at uh, the ASEAN Foundation on how we can uh, confine our, our design for this year. Uh, yeah. We expect, you know, you know, ideally, I want to start this sooner than later, but you know, we're, we're concerning the pandemic right now, it, it may need to be delayed by a few few months, maybe, but hopefully not too long. I think there's a couple of things that we can do. Just, I just think, I just want to, if I can, one minute of my own personal um, yeah. intake about this. And I think that, you know, despite the fact that we're currently facing a pandemic, um, I think that, you know, this time is actually a great opportunity for you social entrepreneurs to go beyond your limits of your Im imagination to flourish. I mean, the use of the digital economy, the, mm -hmm. the, the industrial 4.0 that Ms. Lala earlier mentioned has accelerated rapidly people having to stay at home. This, mm -hmm. uh, this is also quite a bit of an opportunity for so social entrepreneurs to play roles resulting some of the social issues that arise through the pandemic, such as how we can provide, you know, support to those who are unemployed. Uh, maybe, maybe an app that can retrain them to face the new realities of the normal, the new economy from this pandemic. Mm. You know, social media and through, you know, through social media and learning platforms. You know, and I think just uh, in my own view, things like e-commerce and retail apps can actually help the struggling little mom and pop shops um, that have to close because of the lack of customers to actually not only promote their their products, but also, you know, deliver some of those products, including groceries whatever, or, or other essential goods uh, to the people without, um, without them leaving the home. So, I mm -hmm. mean, um, I'm not an expert on this, to be honest with you. I think Dali later on would have a more of an entrepreneurial mindset and expert uh, expertise on this, but that's just my uh, entry <clears throat> regarding how, how yeah. the pandemic has actually yeah. made it an opportunity rather than... Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Satyo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Satyo, for this uh, uh, great sharing. Uh, I mean, uh, Satyo has mentioned about uh, entrepreneur programs. Huh? Just want to let you know that uh, 
don't think that this is just for uh, technical technology kinds of uh, business uh, uh, because it expand very wide across to uh, waste management environmental any That's projects another. that have social impact you know mm -hmm. and can be innovative enough to sustainable uh, the keyword is sustainability yeah right. because uh, some of the social economic uh, challenge for entrepreneurs uh, social entrepreneurs is actually sustainability so when you want to create this uh, kind of project make sure you have this at the back of your mind and uh, of course uh, we later going to uh, have two sharings from uh, Kamel and also from uh, Dali, yeah, who is actually into this uh, new business, uh, New Horizon, uh, from young people, young idea. So to see how they create something sustainable. So uh, without further ado, let me call upon our fifth uh, speaker of today, which is Kamel Joyce. Kamel actually is the uh, founder of Four Peace uh, for, uh, from Philippines. Uh, so Kamel will talk about her experience, uh, how she developed and create poppies, and how she do her projects to create social impact in her community. Please, uh, Kamel. Uh, I think uh, is Kamel around. We see the button is there, Kamel. Is there uh, issues with the connection? Because uh, during yesterday, we do have uh, issues with connection uh, uh, in Philippines uh, when we do a dry run yesterday. So uh, is Kamil there? Uh, hello? If not, uh, maybe uh, why not we uh, just uh, let Kamil settle her issues on technical and maybe we go for Dali first, shall we? Yeah. I think uh, Dali, uh, uh, come in later, we come back to you. Eh? So, okay, we go for Dali first, Dali Shafar. Eh? Dali is actually a business director of PT Biops Agritechno. Uh, he is a beneficiary of uh, participants of this uh, ASEAN Youth Entrepreneur Programs. So, uh, Dali, I'm going to share about her Biops Agritechno products and how she created this uh, idea eh? coming out with the support of uh, USAID, uh, USAID and also uh, partners to be uh, sustainable. Uh, please uh, go ahead and share, Dali. Thank you, Ms. Yang. So it's, uh, can everyone uh, hear me clearly? Very okay. clear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the opportunity for me to share about Biops Agrotechno and uh, what we are doing last year in uh, SN Impact Challenge. Uh, it's a, an honor for me to share this with you. And uh, yeah, so let me reintroduce myself. My name is Dali. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Biops Agrotechno Indonesia. Uh, we are actually a startup company focusing on the development of agricultural technology. Uh, and we have uh, uh, a dream. We, we are a small company, but we have a big dream <laughs> to bring the new era of agriculture in Indonesia. Uh, let me share my uh, presentation with you. So yeah, before I am going to talk about what we are doing in Biops Agrotechno, I would uh, like to share why I am here actually. <laughs> so last year, uh, we are joining, uh, we were joining ASEAN Impact Challenge. It's, uh, it's some kind of competition or challenge that is organized by uh, Impact Hub uh, Kuala Lumpur, as uh, Masatya has already uh, told uh, before. And this is supported uh, by USAID, uh, ASEAN USAID uh, prospect. And uh, this um, uh, event, the, this challenge is focusing on uh, at least three uh, aspects. The first one is innovation and impact focus. So they are not only focusing on innovation, but also uh, the impact. So uh, the, the themes that is uh, selected in this competition is uh, not only doing the innovation, entrepreneurship and something like that, but they also have to uh, need uh, they, they need to have an impact on the environment and social uh, and uh, uh, for, for the world, for example. And then secondly, alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. And then uh, especially last year, the big topics is uh, about the circular economy. And the third one is uh, the most important thing is collaboration because uh, uh, we may be a small company, small enterprise, but with the collaboration, uh, with private sector, with government, with uh, other initiatives, it can be we can bring more and bigger impacts to uh, to, to the society. And uh, basically, this challenge is divided into two categories. The first one is the start impact uh, for the smaller uh, enterprises, 
and the second one is the scale impact for the bigger enterprises and we joining uh, uh, for the start impact and uh, yeah we won the last year uh, as an impact challenge for the start impact category and then during uh, so for the selected 10 teams we were uh, going to Bangkok Thailand and during a uh, one week of the event we got a very um, amazing um, seminars and capacity building events and then discussion sharings and etc and of course more uh, the most important thing is meeting new friends right so as you can see in the upper right there uh, I have opportunity to meet uh, other initiatives from 10 countries and they are really amazing and have uh, amazing ideas so we share we uh, try to maybe we can collaborate and something like that so uh, uh, we are really thankful for uh, ASEAN Foundation USA for uh, organizing and supporting this event. So we have this kind of uh, a big opportunity for us to, to grow faster and scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. So next I will talk about uh, BIOPS Agritech. No? So uh, as I told you before, we are focusing on the development of agricultural technology, right? So it sounds maybe like a technological company, something like that, but we are actually very focused also on uh, sustainability and uh, um, uh, also the sustainable development goals. So uh, for a basic info, so uh, the, the first problem that we are uh, trying to address is actually about the water use in agricultural sectors. In Indonesia, there more than 80% of the water available is used for the agricultural uh, activities. And then uh, people, um, many people say that this uh, sector is very, very unsustainable because 80% of water is used only for this sector. But then other people will say like, yeah, we really need to produce food, right? We really need to produce food for we to be alive here. Uh, uh, that's very true. But then uh, we have to think that we can still improve the, the process or the, the production process of the food itself. And uh, what I want to say here that uh, the use of water now is not yet sustainable. So, uh, or it's not yet uh, efficient. In some places here, especially in Indonesia, they use too much water than it needs, but the other places, they have a drought problem, they don't have enough water to uh, even uh, produce the food or vegetables. So that's the one problem. The second one is talking about the uh, uh, demography of the farmers in Indonesia, related to the adoption of mechanization and also the technology. So data says that uh, less than 50% uh, of the farmers in Indonesia already adapt the me mechanization and technology for their uh, agriculture, uh, ag agricultural activity. And that makes this uh, sector is very human dependent or uh, human intensive or labor intensive. The problem is that that also says that uh, the majority of farmers that is working as a farmer now is age uh, 40, uh, over 45 years old. So uh, the regeneration is very, very slow. So it's very dangerous for this sector because we have to continuously producing food because uh, people are also increasing. But uh, there are, uh, 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 the regeneration is uh, very slow. So there's also a problem here. So uh, we try to solve these two problem with a uh, single solution. And uh, we came across with this idea of uh, producing climate smart uh, irrigation technology. I will talk about this later. Uh, but then I would say that this is the, not the only uh, technology that's already there in this sector. Because currently we can find sensors technology, app-based irrigation technology already uh, used by some of the farmers. However, the big problem why the adaptation is uh, very slow is because uh, to utilize this kind of technology, we really need we really needed uh, some kind of knowledge, and that's not the case uh, in Indonesia because I believe that uh, many farmers. So 90 90 percent of the farmers in Indonesia is smallholder farmers, and they don't have that uh, some extent of, tech, uh, of of knowledge. So that's why we try to uh, make uh, or create a new concept of technology. To actually, this technology is maybe more uh, complicated or more sophisticated, by, but uh, with the addition of this new technology, we can make this kind of technology usable and adaptable to the condition here in Indonesia. 
and this is uh, how incomotion works. Uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, practical, but uh, yeah. So uh, incomotion is actually a machine-to-machine -machine IoT technology. So it's Internet of Things technology. So we have sensors that we put in the uh, agricultural area that can uh, retrieve the temperature data, light intensity, humidity, and etc. And then uh, these data then sent to our server where we put our uh, unique algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is can actually calculate how much water needed by the plants uh, specifically uh, uh, on uh, this condition. So it's based on the condition. So if it's, for example, too high in the temperature, they need more water. But yeah, so we have this uh, algorithm to calculate it. And the result is, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the amount of water is actually needed by these specific crops and this specific condition. Then this data sent again to the to the device, and then the device will automatically control the irrigation system. Uh, by this, we um, we hope and we actually already uh, assess that we can uh, uh, address the problem of the water efficiency and also the human dependency. And uh, this is some numbers that I can share. So uh, you can see this photo. Uh, he is uh, Richie. He is one of our partners, farmer, fa uh, farmers partners, he is a uh, bell peppers farmers in the West Java area here in Indonesia. So uh, collaborating with him uh, since uh, two years ago, we can increase his productivity. We can help him increase his productivity by 40% by using only uh, incomotion. Secondly, we can also reduce the operational cost by 50%. And this number may come from, uh, so we, uh, uh, so for the irrigation activity, which usually needs one, two hours for one uh, worker to do the irrigation, uh, but then using this one, we can reduce that time uh, of the operational, and then they can do other things, other activities uh, in the farm. So they can uh, cut the operational cost and the operational time. Uh, mm -hmm. Last but not least, uh, talking about the sustainability of the water, we can reduce the water by 40%. So if you can see here using Encomotion, we can increase productivity, but we reduce the use of water, meaning that previously they used too much water and then uh, maybe they it, it reduces the productivity. So uh, with Encomotion, we, uh, we hope that we can bring the social impact uh, mm -hmm. by bringing more uh, income for the farmers, but we also contribute to the environment by reducing the use of water. Mm, okay. And uh, where we are now, so uh, we are based in uh, West Java, so most of our users are in uh, West Java, but we also have partners in Central Java, East Java, and lastly in uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur, or East Nusa Tenggara, which is a very dry area because it's surrounded by uh, sea, and uh, we hope uh, there will be following uh, activities or following uh, collaboration with uh, people in uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur this year, uh, and uh, so we can help them to produce more foods and uh, they can be self-sufficient. Uh, so this is some pictures of uh, how small and commotion is. So it's a very, very handy small uh, device, but it uh, do a lot of to, uh, for the irrigation. So as you can see there in the upper right, you can see it uh, is installed uh, in the open field uh, fa uh, farm or you can, it can also apply in the uh, greenhouse farming. Uh, and we utilize the drip irrigation, which is most efficient irrigation that we can find. Uh, right now. Mm. Uh, I think that's uh, my last slide, but uh, before I finish, maybe I would add a little bit about youth and uh, entrepreneurship and social mm. impacts. So mm. uh, I think, so as a young generation right now, we are uh, that living in, uh, in this era, I think we have a lot of benefits, right? We have uh, unlimited access to information. Uh, um, uh, for example, in one click, you will know what is happening right now in the other part of the world, only mm. one click away, right? So yeah. despite the drawbacks, uh, but I believe it brings a lot of uh, benefits for us. For example, mm. I believe with this kind of benefit, we can have uh, higher empathy to what is actually happening in this world. So we have empathy on, uh, um, uh, on the social problems, on uh, environmental problems. So that's why I think uh, nowadays many uh, young generation are already aware and have a passion on doing this, this social impact. Secondly, we also have a benefits uh, of a support system. 
I think uh, right now when we want to start uh, this initiative, innovation, a lot of people, a lot of initiative, a lot of uh, um, or organization will help us. Government or uh, non-government organization will really help us. For example, uh, BIOPS Agrotechno last year is uh, half of very good uh, capacity building activities uh, supported by ASEAN uh, and also USAID and that's uh, very, very impactful for us. So that's a very big benefit for us. So that's why uh, I think uh, we as a young generation, let's find our patient and mm -hmm. get the benefits and then uh, if you want to start to do something for the society and for the environment and mm -hmm. start it and let's make an impact for the society. Thank you so much, Dali. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you for the inspiring uh, talk. I, uh, the sharing, uh, I mean, I'm so good to um, actually point out uh, the, uh, what you mentioned is the opportunity so much there out there now. Uh, you're living yeah. in a time that you can access to so many things, uh, resources, information, technology. So there's a, no excuse not to be able to do something, isn't it? So it's just, yeah, the, yeah. I, I think people are going to hit me after this. It's, it's just laziness, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it's like, um, be more uh, innovative right now. Huh? So, okay, so uh, the time is really go ahead uh, abroad to our limitation time. But anyway, uh, we managed to get back our Camille. Is Camille uh, yeah. back, yeah? Yeah, thank you so much for coming back. So yeah. uh, we will go to Camille first and um, before we go for Q&A. Uh, Camille is actually a founder of Four Peace again from Philippines and also the winner of the last uh, uh, social journalism uh, competition, yeah? So I'll pass the uh, mic to uh, Camille. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm Camille Joyce Lisai from the Philippines. So to begin, I would like to say that many people around the world say that the youth is the hope of the future, but actually youth is the future. And uh, what better way to inherit a better world but to actually start working towards it now? And the uh, advice that I would like to impart to everyone is you don't have to think big right away. You know, uh, it would be impossible to change the world in an instant. We can start small and we can start in our community. Hence, we founded our campaign for peace for Philippines. So this presentation will be divided into three parts. First, uh, we will discuss the background of our campaign, what 4 Peace is, what we do, and uh, where we came from. Second part is the social impact of our campaign in the duration and after the campaign stretch. And finally, we would like to share to you the future potential, the budding potential of our campaign. So, this is the banner head of our campaign and our social media sites. It's for peace for Philippines. So background, it was founded in September, 2019 as an entry of the Philippines to the ASEAN Youth Social Journalism Contest. So what we do is we aim to document the implementation of a poverty alleviation program in the Philippines called for peace. Hence, the name for peace for philippines for peace stands for patawid familia filipino program which in english means feed the poor filipino family program so what for peace is is that it's a ccp a conditional cash transfer that gives cash to the poorest families in return for sending their kids to school and availing their healthcare needs so this cash assistance is given monthly to these beneficiaries. It's primarily implemented by our social welfare development, social welfare department. So this is what our Facebook page looks like. It's a social journalism uh, campaign and we currently have over 120,000 followers. This is our Twitter and our Instagram account. So we won championship last January 2020. We were formally recognized by the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, this is their press release recognizing us as champions of the contest, as well as several media, media institutions such as Philippine Information Agency and other media in our country. 
So, what happened during the pitching process for this campaign? Actually, during the pitching period, uh, to be completely honest, we had no topic in mind. Uh, we had uh, extreme difficulty coming up with a, a good local community project to be implemented once we come back to the Philippines because there are a lot of campaigns and uh, causes already uh, established in our country. Our civil society is very vibrant. Actually, what we thought of is we can, uh, we can establish a campaign about LGBT, about human rights, about uh, freedom of information, but we found out there are a lot of campaigns about it already. But this one, the idea about For Peace for Philippines came uh, on a whim. Uh, we thought about it because Nobody has taken a campaign about it yet. No independent cause has taken a focus on this particular program by the government. So the primary motivation personally for me why we, we, why we chose this campaign is because I was personally skeptic to the program. I personally thought of it as a dole out or a band aid program that won't solve the poverty in our country. It will be remembered that poverty remains to be the top problem in our country and uh, it also is a phenomenon that happens around the world. However, upon choosing this campaign and during its stretch, we found out that the program actually decreased poverty incidence by 1.3% and it's significant because it translates to a million, uh, a So 1.3% means it's at least 1.3 million Filipinos in 2017. So during the execution, we reached 50,000 people in one month alone. And uh, this is what we accomplished. We had over 20 exclusive interviews published through multimedia article and uh, videos. We had over 70 publicity materials and around 10 multimedia articles. So how, how did we recruit volunteers? First, we recruited uh, based on word of mouth. So most of our volunteers are our personal friends who express their interest in volunteering uh, to our campaign. And then secondly, we chose the top fans in our page and communities who happen to be DSWD, DSWD staff. So this is our social welfare department that implements the program. So we work alongside with them in uh, uh, managing our large community. So what are the factors that led to the campaign? So these are the main factors that we thought in mind in uh, coming up with this campaign. First, our campaign has to be timely and relevant. So we thought that our campaign should shed light on an ongoing issues. So since this is a local community project, it should be a socially relevant issue that uh, we should uh, build our advocacy around. And then second factor is monopoly on the cause. No one has built an advocacy around the issue. Of course, as I said, our civil society is vibrant. There are a lot of causes, NGOs, and several other uh, advocacies that are built in around the uh, social, uh, many socially relevant issues in our country, such as LGBT, uh, human rights. But what sets our campaign apart is that no one has built an advocacy around parties yet. And finally, audience reach. A large audience should be able to identify with your campaign. In this case, our main stakeholders or audience are the poor, the poorest sectors. So they are our audience and they are large enough. So how to induce wide audience engagement offline? First, you have to organize your campaign. Study your audience. If you target a particular sector in your society, you have to study them. So in our case, we formulated a database for our audience, meaning those who express their interest in participating in our public transparency campaign is uh, we, listed them down, we listed them down on a database. So this is what our database looked like. Roughly, it's uh, more than 54 pages. And uh, grassroots reach. Identify where they are. You have to identify where they live. So in this case, in this list, 
their uh, addresses are uh, identified. And then what we did is we highlighted those people who live, uh, who are concentrated within a particular area, and then we came to that area. So know their location and go there. In this case, the, these are the locations that we were able to reach offline. We went to Tondo, Tayuman in Manila. We went to Graceville. We went to several other parts of uh, Bulacan, where I live. So finally, you have to study their culture. You have to be able to speak and walk like them and then assimilate. So what we also discovered in this campaign is that the beneficiaries of this program has their own culture. They call each other uh, in specific names, PL, Kabene, and other things. So in coming up with a campaign, you also have to study the culture of your audience. So social impact of our campaign. So as a, a community has uh, been created through our campaign, which currently has over to 30,000 uh, members and uh, it's growing. And then we also organized many activities, exclusive activities such as contests. This is a writing contest uh, and then a petition signing for those people who want to be part of the program. Uh, flyer distribution to many parts of uh, Manila and also information dissemination to them. Also, we uh, always clarif clarify that we are not representatives of the official social welfare department. So uh, our campaign in the time of coronavirus. So we're all aware that COVID-19 has swept the world by storm and uh, the Philippines actually reported the first fatality throughout the world because it's uh, close to the ground zero, which is Wuhan. So we're currently on lockdown for exactly 60 days now. So basic economic activities are at a standstill, prompting the government to offer alternative social development programs. So our campaign now remains relevant more than ever because we want to shed light on the implementation of a particular social development program. And the government now offers alternative other social development programs, not limited to parties. So public transport is not available, tourist sectors are on a no work, no pay basis, so they really need access to information about the available portfolio of social development programs that the government offers. And that is where our campaign enters the picture because we disseminate the uh, we disseminate information on uh, the alternative social development programs of the government. These are some of the few. And uh, the primarily social development program offered by the government in the time of COVID-19 is this. It's called SAP, Social Amelioration Program. So this is what we achieved during the lockdown. Our audience uh, and reach doubled by from 50,000 to more than 100,000. So that includes our views, our reach, uh, engagement, likes, and followers. So the potential of the campaign uh, in, in the future. Currently, a research by me was uh, recently approved by the Social Welfare Department evaluating the implementation of this program in a particular area. This is what the uh, approval letter looks like. So uh, they said that uh, I have to present in front of them uh, in order to uh, my research to be formally recognized. And uh, they just approved it. So uh, I already finished the research. Uh, I just have to wait for lockdown to end in order to be able to present in front of the panel of the social welfare department. Second recruitment, in order for a campaign to expand further, we have to recruit more volunteers who could take part in our information dissemination campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, uh, uh, the campaign is urged to sit a meeting with the, implement with the implementer of 4 Peace, which is the Social Welfare Department, and sign the MOU with them. We already communicated with them and they told us that uh, we have to sign this uh, memorandum with them in order for our campaign to be legitimate and credible and recognized. But we have to take note that we still operate independently of the social welfare department. Mm. Finally, I would like to share some important mm. words to our fellow ASEAN youth mm. in coming up with a campaign on their own. First, 
you have to find your own advocacy. And how can you find your own advocacy? But of course, by starting with your own pas passion. So you have to, you have to re refer to your own passion, what you're passionate about, what you like studying, what you like, uh, what you like pursuing for a really, really long time, what you would like to fight for. Uh, Camille, uh, this is the most important part, but Camille, <laughs> Camille we, we lost you a bit, yeah. So find your advocacy, yeah, please continue. Okay, so second part is you have to study your advocacy religiously. So finding your advocacy is only the first part. You have to study it intently and day by day because uh, information changes and uh, information is also abundant. You have to start from where your advocacy began, how it developed, and uh, so on and so forth. This is for you to become a credible uh, representative of your advocacy or a credible uh, advocate of your <clears throat> cause. So you have to study it. Yeah. Finally, of course, uh, thirdly, you have to commit to your advocacy also religiously. So how can you derive commitment to your advocacy but by, of course, devotion to it? You have to study it uh, day by day. You have to always be updated to it. You have to keep yourself always uh, informed about it. And uh, finally, of course, you can only commit to it if you love your advocacy. So in my case, yeah. I love my advocacy. So yeah. I keep sustaining it. I, I keep sustaining it even after the competition because uh, we've reached a large community already and uh, Mm -hmm. we get to interact with our audience one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Yeah, so, thank you. Mm. Love your advocacy with all mm. your heart. Yeah, so, thank you so course, much. Yeah. Believe in it. Believe in believe it. Believe in your advocacy. So, yeah. that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Camille. Uh, thank you so much for the passion. Uh. I can feel the passionate about what you're doing. Uh. It is very important for you to sustain. Actually, I just want to mention that um, uh, thank you so much for all the uh, speakers for your sharing. Uh, we have exceeded our allocated time <laughs> to uh, vary a lot uh, yeah, because uh, the, the topic is so interesting. So I can't really stop you. Uh, if I stop you, it will be like hanging, you know. So uh, I will just ask for permission from all of you that we extend, extend for another 15 minutes just for the Q&A. Okay, so... <clears throat> Any Q and A that we have now, uh, just we let's answer it in the shortest time we can. Huh? <clears throat> so, uh, I do receive some uh, questions, um, and uh, there are some questions, uh, but I picked uh, from Ambassador Passporn, one uh, from Thailand, <clears throat> uh, means my ambassador, our board. She do have <clears throat> one valid questions, which I think is pretty important. <clears throat> How can ASEC or ASEAN Secretary through collaboration with ASEAN Foundation address uh, concern of youth during COVID-19, especially when AF, uh, ASEAN Foundation has an excellent network of youth and alumni. <clears throat> and then also uh, it talks to uh, us about, second question is, how can ASEC through collaboration with uh, ASEAN Foundation address interest and maybe concern of youth with disability? So, uh, I won't answer it on behalf, but I will give it to maybe Diman. Huh? Uh, is it Diman or is it Lala to actually answer this question? Because, uh, I mean, they're uh, later on our add in, they uh, are representing ASEAN Foundation. Uh, okay. Mm. So, uh, do I start first? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first, thank you, Ambassador Paspon, for the question. Yeah. Uh, these are very valid indeed. Uh, yeah. For the first one um, on COVID, um, the SOMI has a collaboration with uh, the IFRC, the Red Crescent Society, uh, the Red Cross. And uh, that collaboration is focusing on uh, the potential of youth as the agents of change. So. Um, the, we have this program called the Youth Agents of Change Peer-to-Peer -peer Training. So the focus <clears throat> is on uh, strengthening the soft skills 
and 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 uh, basically the 21st century skills of the youth and also their awareness on societal issues. And uh, this has been running for about a year. Uh, mm -hmm. So the recruitment of the youth delegates uh, were done through uh, the SOMI, the, the youth sector. And uh, we have discussed uh, for uh, how, how we will continue this collaboration in the future. So basically the IFRC uh, has the expertise in terms of um, uh, addressing issues, pandemics, emergencies, and also uh, this very good focus on the development of soft skills for the youth who are involved in uh, taking part in addressing those uh, emergencies and also uh, societal issues. While the ASEAN Foundation, I'm pretty sure that uh, you have a very, very uh, expansive network, right, of, of uh, yeah. Uh, the alumni of all yes. the programs. Mm. So yeah. uh, perhaps if these two can be combined, and also uh, of course <coughs> in cooperation with us and Secretariat, yeah. this can create something that is um, quite impactful for uh, our youth. So mm -hmm. the expertise uh, of the IFRC and the network of AF, and then also yeah. our uh, connection <coughs> with the youth sector. Yeah, this can be uh, discussed. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lala. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have. Uh, I mean, uh, this is the time that uh, everyone is have to work together. That's why we are also working with US Aid and all Prospect mm -hmm. to do uh, some programs. You know, uh, we can always design program. But just to share with you that actually ASEAN Foundation uh, ha do have uh, some uh, sort of coverage and special attention given to. Uh, uh, people with uh, special disability, uh, special ability, I call it, uh, because, um, well, for instance, uh, uh, currently, uh, currently we just have uh, autism uh, kids, uh, youth, to do internship with us, and then also they expand the same in, uh, autism uh, interns went to um, uh, do it in ASEAN Secretary after they finish with the ASEAN Foundation. So, um, of course, we also open up for our internship for anybody. Uh, all, all youth, uh, we don't have specific uh, like uh, limitation like you have to be uh, mobile or whatever, you know, so we always open it and we are willing to actually train uh, young, young people uh, in all folks of uh, life. Uh. And then well, we do have a program also called ASEAN Digital Innovation Programs, uh, uh, which we open now and focus for uh, people with uh, a special disability. Uh, so also for women and uh, for people, uh, groups that who is not been uh, given attention all this time. Uh, so we have inclusiveness uh, in some of our programs. And uh, for me, sometimes I came, <clears throat> just to share with you, I came from the uh, people with special disability uh, person. I'm a, 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 that kind of category person. But as I mentioned sometimes, uh, it is uh, uh, not advisable to actually keep keep reminding yourself that you are different from others, you know. So <clears throat> for me, the way to carry on is to always strive for the best and do your best. Uh, it, you, you don't want people to call you any difference, you know. So there is a lot of opportunities and most of the opportunities open in this uh, ASEAN platform uh, uh, has never stated that you have to be super fit or you have to be athletics to join, you know. So for me, is uh, do not put any uh, hurdles or anything to block yourself from coming forward. Now, so that is really my advice for uh, people with special abilities. Huh? <clears throat> so, uh, of course, uh, I hope that we do uh, answer uh, the ambassador passport. Huh? So, I think we go to other questions because um, I have so many questions, but I miss can't really. Miss Tian. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Uh, just would like to uh, add a little bit of information about yes. uh, uh, about persons with disability. We just want yeah. to inform that yeah. uh, the first winner of the AYSJ 2017, yeah. his um, his essay was yeah. about a person with disability because he was also uh, on a wheelchair. Yeah. So uh, so he was he participated in the program um, and uh, was treated uh, the same and then he won first place oh, so yes congratulations so, so good. He, <laughs> his, his campaign his campaign and his team uh, and his uh, partner also uh, touch on uh, 
about persons with disability and they made um, what is that they showcase uh, uh, what is that? Um, they showcase uh, in uh, in the public or in uh, expos uh, about uh, advocating about uh, about disability, about yeah. uh, helping people with disability. Yes. Yeah. Thank so, you for the uh, yes. points. Yeah. That is that yes, is actually yes. very inspiring. Yeah? For right. me, it's like that. We never stop anyone from coming forward yeah? and join yeah. all our programs. And also, uh, our office is uh, moving. Yeah? So ASEAN Foundation is getting closer and closer to uh, ASEAN Secretariat. Yeah? We are going to be in the same building. So what we do is um, uh, we make sure that our buildings are accessible also yeah? for people with uh, special ability to be able to go to do internships and uh, come and attach with us, you know. So <clears throat> there are certain things that we are doing that, of course, um, in future, we will, uh, we have been doing it anyway to engage with the CSO uh, uh, to reach out to the people who is less, uh, who is, has not been taken care of, who has not been uh, included in many programs, uh, like uh, uh, Camille also, you know, and then Dali also, is our CSO, and then of course we can't do it on our own. We have to do partnership with CSO. So the young people now, like uh, Camille, I really like to actually also open up the floor with you. Uh, to actually partner with us on the because I like your programs. Uh, Feed the poor Philippine families. Uh, because uh, after COVID nineteen, I think uh, these issues will be more rampant. More or more, you know, more people need help. So I think uh, we are also in the process of uh, discussing with some of our other stakeholders and partners uh, to actually do something for the COVID, uh, uh, post-COVID, uh, to help out with more people. So we're going to just <coughs> announce it later. But uh, there are many questions that um, I still have, but I think I'm going to pick uh, one or two more questions. Uh, there's one question that says that there is uh, there have been increasing interest on business and human rights and social impacts. It will be good if AF and U USAID can work towards building or funding summer sco uh, school programs to cover those topics. Uh, so, uh, what can uh, can I pass it to USAID to actually answer this? Any anything we can do together? Well, thank you. Uh, just. Uh want to add about the COVID-19 from the ambassador response uh, before yeah. that uh, directly after the COVID-19 outbreak we got direction from uh, Washington DC that we need to provide mm. emergency response so the current one is for the emergency response uh, rapid response because that's what we need to yeah. support and then mm -hmm. but but at the same time we also provide a uh, long-term <coughs> support uh, that uh, we are building the concept node with ASEAN directly uh, to coordinate the pandemic response coordinations so mm -hmm. it is in the process direct in, in uh, you know currently and we hope that with this uh, coordinations i said will be able and better respond in the futures you know uh, yeah. they, they have it now but mm -hmm. then it, it will be better in the, in the next uh, pandemic uh, for this uh, the, the questions on the business and human rights <coughs> we actually have uh, uh, what uh, we call the Summer Institute. We, so Prospect has a lot of programs and also progress. Uh, we also has a human rights portions. So we promote human rights to the AICHA, the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. And I also want to connect it with the Eric Risky uh, questions about the ASEAN Court strengthening the law enforcement because it's the same answer actually. Through the AICHA, they are an opportunity on the AICHA youth debate actually. So this youth debate programs uh, uh, provide opportunity for youth law enforcement about court, about business and uh, human rights. Uh, business uh, meaning because of the Asian economic community is open up. You know whether it will have implication with the human rights uh, that that is still debatable and then still need be need to be to be assessed. So there are a lot of pro opportunity in this and then. Uh, I, at now, I think uh, the for specifically for COVID-19, uh, it's the volunteerism will be very good. This time is for actions. So USAID has provided or invested a lot of program on volunteerism. Like we provided that we work with the University of Bangsa Malaysia on the ASEAN Youth Volunteers programs. And one of the topic actually a couple of years ago was about disaster management, how to manage a disaster. 
So if mm. we consider this a disaster, then you know there should be like a voluntarism from the youth uh, yeah. to address the situation. It doesn't have to be huge, you know. It can yeah. be from your community, for neighborhoods, you know. Mm. And uh, so because this is the time for actions. We cannot wait for others, you know, uh, 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 support yeah. for us. Yeah, uh, thank you for that demand. And uh, I think I will post the last questions uh, because we only have about one more minute. <laughs> I can't even have time to do a summary. <clears throat> uh, maybe post it to uh, Dali or Kamel. Can take it there. Questions like some youth ask, how would I, how can I start uh, doing uh, business uh, or start something, uh, development? Uh, how, how do I want to start? Uh, how do you do it? You know, maybe just a few pointers. Uh, well, yeah, maybe I can yeah. so uh, business, social business or, or or any other business is starting with uh, you want to uh, do something for the users, right? You want to uh, uh, tackle the problem of the users so that you can have a, a products that or service that can help the users. So start with that. You have to learn. You have to uh, you have to see what is the problem, mm -hmm. especially if we, with the uh, impact business or impact uh, startup. You have to really. Uh, hear what they need, what they want, and then you start, and then you think, you idea, yeah, you you start the ideation process, and then uh, from there you if you 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 find the support, and then um, uh, it it will it will flow like <laughs> it it will just flow like that. But it it you have to start with a, like a very basic, uh, a, a very good basic on uh, what is the problem. I think mm. that's, that's the key. Okay, so thanks, uh, Dali. I think uh, I'm so sorry that <laughs> questions keeps coming in. Uh. I have more than another 15 questions, which I cannot take it. I'm so sorry for that. I think uh, what Dali pointed out is true. And I think the basic of all these things, you want to start something, you have to actually read a lot. Huh? Yeah. To do a lot of readings and be more knowledgeable. Only then you know what is the issues, actually. If not, you will not be able to do something meaningful. You know, so that is the advice. So thank you so much for all the speakers, uh, for your time, and then so for the very good sharing from our uh, youth, Camille and Dali. So we wish you all the best to your business and then to what you're doing. So I hope that uh, today's sessions actually uh, create some impact uh, and motivate more youth to come forward and uh, join our programs and also bring back the knowledge and skills to benefit your people. So I, I just want to add one word because there is a question asking, when is the video competition coming out? Uh, Gaya, <laughs> when are we going to announce it? <laughs> Social journalism and video. Uh, um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, for the video contest, um, uh, for the video contest, we, we are actually waiting for the right time to launch it. We're actually ready actually to launch it. It's just that we want to see that the situation of the COVID-19 to be better, to, to be, to be uh, lessened and the restrictions to be lessened because, uh, and to be more flexible in all ASEAN member states. Because um, submitting the, the one minute video would require the participants to record videos and shoot videos. So uh, they would need movements. And the next theme um, they, they can already read in the Facebook page is about women in sports. So it's also, it requires mobility. So uh, uh, it would be best to, uh, to wait until the situation is better uh, as yeah. advised by, by Pak Diman as well. Yeah, we hope that yeah. if yeah, by this year, this yeah. Year. Yeah, if by this year it's already um, it's already better, then uh, we can start launching the video contest. Yeah, social journalism will also uh, still take part. Uh, we don't know when. Um, if again, if not this year, probably early next year. Yeah. Yeah, because um, because of the COVID actually. Yeah? Yes. Because yes. If not, no. we will actually launch most of our programs already. Okay. Before I end, mm -hmm. uh, there are many requests on PPT slides. Uh, you have to uh, just make an announcement. Uh, you have to register with us uh, through HTTPS. Uh, just now we already posted and we are going to post it more in our social media and our website. Our form, uh, you have to fill in the form so that we can actually send you uh, the PPT. Okay. And then also uh, please uh, keep in touch with us uh, via our social media, social platform. We have all the Instagram, 
Facebook and everything, okay? So that's all for today. And then uh, we're going to come back again next time for a uh, bit more uh, sharing, okay? Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.